Thank you very much. I just want to point out I'm not actually on the FIFA Medical Commission. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you are a FIFA Medical Officer. Officer. Sorry. Terms. Um, I chose this um, topic this morning not because I want to be controversial, although I understand it is controversial, but basically because as a sports physician, first of all, I should say I have no conflicts of interest other than that I'm a woman. Um, so as a sports physician, I have many potential roles, and I feel reasonably comfortable with all of them. But there's one that doesn't sit quite so well, and that is the one of sex verification. <clears throat> if we, for me, it was quite hard to understand what everything was about, and I found it the easiest to go back to the, really go back to the basics and try and understand what happens um, in sexual development, embryo development, and then secondary sexual characteristics. So if you really go back to the basics, it's the X and the Y chromosome. And although the, y, the X chromosome has three times as many base pairs as the Y chromosome, it is the Y chromosome that actually determines the sex of a baby. And it's specifically the SRY gene, uh, which is uh, called the sex uh, regulating, uh, or sex determining area of the Y, y uh, chromosome that actually causes um, the development into a male baby. And I'll explain to you how. So essentially, when you have a zygote, it's either, either it's XX or XY. <clears throat> if it is XY, that means that there's an SRY gene. And the SRY gene will then cause the development of testes. And it's the development of testes that then causes the secretion of testosterone. Obviously, this is a very simple way of putting it because the testosterone is uh, secreted in other ways too, and also in women. But this is the most important one. And in the presence of testosterone receptors, then the secondary characteristics of a man develop. So when you have the opposite, where there's no SRY gene, because there's no Y chromosome, then the testes doesn't develop, and the baby develops ovaries, which then secretes the female hormones. So that means that whether you're XX or XY is your chromosomal sex, or your genotype, and whether you have the body of a man or a woman is your somatic sex or your phenotype. As you can imagine, things can go wrong in a number of places. And so, uh, and I'll touch on those, but just for now, if, it, if you have something other than XX or XY, that's called intersex. That's the only condition that's called intersex. There's a lot of other things that people confuse with that. But this is, it's when it's chromosomally there's a problem that that's an intersex condition. So to just explain to you what could happen, it is possible that you can have a translocation of this SRY gene. So you could have an X chromosome with an SRY gene, and equally you can have a Y chromosome without that gene. And there's a number of reasons why that might happen, including environmental reasons. So then you can see if you have an XX zygote and you have an SRY gene on one of the X chromosomes, that um, embryo will develop a testes, which then will lead to the body of a man. Equally, you can have an XY chromosome without the SRY gene, and then you will develop into the body of a female or a woman. Then, of course, there's androgen insensitivity syndrome. So in this case, everything is working as normal, except your testosterone receptors are not sensitive <coughs> to the testosterone. They're either partially insensitive, in which case often you would develop a body more like a man, but if it's completely insensitive, then you will develop exactly like a woman. Now, if we think about that for a moment, for all the women out there in the audience who haven't done a chromosome test and who haven't done a testosterone level and haven't got a baby, it means that that could be you. You could possibly have XY chromosomes, even though you feel completely like a woman. This is a photo of all of these women have got androgen insensitivity syndrome, and they, they wanted to show this photo to show the world that there's no stigma attached to it. These are normal women. They're not male imposters. And then, of course, there are other conditions like con uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia and 5-alpha fi reductase deficiency that where um, excessive levels of androgen or, or androgens are produced, and you have sensitive receptors. So then the big question there is, is that giving them an advantage from a sports perspective or not? So as you can see, sex is not really binary. It's not really male and female. There's a big spectrum. 
And of course, the big question is, well, how many people fall within that spectrum? And that's hard to say because there's a stigma attached to it and people don't go and look for it. So, but by all, uh, by some estimations, it is anything from one in 5,000 people to one in 60 people, depending on which conditions you include in this definition. So it's much more common than we think. In fact, this concept of having something other than a male or female uh, gender is now becoming more and more accepted. This is just an example of all the gender types you can choose on Facebook. And there are countries that now legally accept a third gender. These are the countries and there's some moves in more countries to start accepting this. So now that we have an understanding of more or less how things work, it's easier to see, to understand the history of sex testing and also where the problems are. So first it started in 1928. Um, with on-demand visual inspection. So if somebody thought that somebody wasn't a woman participating in the women's competition, then they could be subjected to a visual inspection. Then in 1946, uh, it was uh, decided that this is now mandatory for all women, and every woman had to have a letter from their physician to say that they've been inspected and they are a woman. Um, and then in 1966, the sports authorities decided they couldn't really trust the individual countries to certify that they women are women. So they then introduced what rapidly became known as the nude parade. So in front, before any big competition, there was a panel of doctors who I inspected these girls and decided whether they were in fact women or not. As you can imagine, that was very unpopular. And a lot of women felt it was also discriminating against women in general because men didn't have to undergo this. Then in 1967, the bar body test was put in place. So now instead of looking at the the somatic sex, the focus shifted to the chromosomal sex. And already when the bar body was being introduced in sport, it was already getting questioned in the medical community. Um, the reason for that being that the bar body is something that's present when you have an inactivated X chromosome. And you have an inactivated X chromosome when you have an active X chromosome. So you can imagine when you have XX, you'll have one bar body. And when you have XY, you'll have no bar bodies. So that was meant to be the test. But of course, the problem there is that when you have somebody who's intersex and they have, an, say, an XO, that means they will have a negative bar body test, suggesting that they have a male chromosomal sex, but they don't have a Y chromosome. And equally, if you have XXY, that will give you a positive bar body test, suggesting that you have a, f a female genotype, but in fact, you don't. So then, in 1992, the PCR was introduced, and this was meant to be a much more sensitive test, and it is more sensitive. And what it does, it replicates the SRY gene on the Y chromosome, so it's meant to identify male chromosomal sex. Again, you can probably imagine where the problem is with that one. So when you have somebody who has XX chromosomes, and they, don't, they do have a SRY gene because of translocation, that's going to be a positive test, even though they have XX chromosomes. And equally, if you have XY chromosomes, but you don't have your SRY gene, that's going to test negative. So that didn't help all that much either. In the end, in 1999, the test was completely abandoned. And then in 2011, the um, sports authorities decided that for women to compete in the women's uh, competition, you had to have testosterone levels below 10 nanomoles per litre. Um, and if you didn't, that could be, you could get there either by having surgery to remove any rudimentary testes or by having, taking hormone treatment. As you can imagine, that was also not very popular because the argument was many of these conditions don't actually have any medical problems. So why take medication and more importantly, why have surgery for something which is not actually medically a problem, just so that you can compete? And there was, in fact, even an article in the BMJ suggesting that this is unethical. So then in 2014, D.T. Chand, I didn't, there are lots of women examples I could have given you, but uh, we don't have the time for that. So I've just decided to focus on the, the most recent one. So she's an Indian sprinter. Um, just before the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, a doctor from the International uh, Athletics Federation of India, sorry, Ath India Athletics Federation, uh, said to her that she needs to do a test. 
I mean, tests are often done for dope, doping, etc., as you know. Um, but she said she wasn't told what it was for, and it was a slightly different test to the normal. After that, she then had to go for further testing, which re uh, basically involved um, uh, more blood tests, an MR scan, and an examination of her external genitalia and measurement of her external genitalia, which she found mortifying. Um, and then after that, she was told that she failed the sex test and that she can get back. She, she couldn't participate anymore, but she can get back if she had surgery or had hormone replacement therapy or hormone therapy. And at this point, she decided that she's not going to because of the reasons I've already said. So she then took the case to the Court of Arbitration and Sport, who in April, or I think it's July 2015, uh, said that she could compete again. They temporarily um, suspended this requirement from the IAAF and gave them two years to come up with evidence to say that um, there is a significant advantage with um, endogenous testosterone in women who have uh, receptive, uh, receptors that are sensitive. So the debate continues. In the meantime, there have been some studies. One of them looked at uh, elite athletes in a post-competition setting and found that although there is a significant difference in the mean values of testosterone between men and women, um, there are many elite male athletes that have low testosterone levels. Some would say maybe this is because of doping, but uh, not what they found in the study anyway. And um, uh, amongst the elite female athletes, there are quite a few of them that have high and sometimes very high testosterone levels. And so they basically said that there's a significant overlap between the sexes, which would suggest that you can't necessarily say that the testosterone gives such an advantage. And of course, there's been a study that was supported by the IAAF um, looking at hormone levels in uh, athletes who participated in the 2011 and 2013 World Championships. And they found that in the 400 meter, 400 meter hurdles, 800 meter hammer throw and pole vault, that there were significant differences between the women with the highest levels of testosterone and those with the lowest levels, to the order of you know, 2 to 3% in general. Interestingly, they didn't find any significant changes in the women's 100 meters, 100 meter hurdles, or 200 meters. And in fact, when you actually look at the numbers, the trend is for those disciplines, the women with the lower testosterone levels actually had faster times, but it wasn't st statistically significant. Um, and of course, there was no such pattern found in the male athletic events. So, many questions remain. One of them, why is there no correlation between testosterone levels and performance in men? Is it possibly because it's endogenous? Um, and I think this is a really important point because there's such an unfortunate um, correlation between sex testing and drug testing. And for the public out there, many people think it's the same thing. And even for those who don't think that this is intentional cheating, they think, well, maybe it's unintentional cheating. And that's not necessarily true, because we don't know for sure that endogenous ex testosterone has the same effect as the exogenous. And then, of course, there are many elite athletes who have androgen insensitivity syndrome, so they have no response to testosterone. And equally, there are many women who have polycystic ovary syndrome with high levels of testosterone, and they, not, they don't put it, uh, take part in sport. Equally, we know that in athletes, testosterone levels are generally higher than they are in the normal population, so how much higher? We also don't know, is there a difference between the male response to testosterone and the female response to testosterone? There may be. And then the other thing is the degree of advantage. So in this last study, the degree of advantage was 1% to 3%, but we know that across almost all sports, the difference between men and women's performance is about 10 to 12% which incidentally is the same, more or less the same, as the difference in relative lean body mass and also relative VO2 max. Maybe that has a much bigger influence. So while we're discussing these things, I think it's important that we understand that in the meantime, we are violating <coughs> individual athletes' human rights in the process. Definitely, I would say that they are getting discriminated against uh, based on their sex. Um, Many of them have suffered degrading treatment, and almost all of them have had a problem with their privacy being invaded. In fact, um, there's been many sad cases, one of them even involving attempted suicide because of the, 
the invasion of privacy, being ostracized from the community, etc. So, can we justify that for the sake of fair play, as we say? Because this is normally what people say, well, it's the level playing field that we're trying to create here, a bit like drug testing. The problem is that I don't think there's such a thing as a level playing field in elite sport. That's why I'm standing up here talking about it instead of being on the field doing it. And I understand that, obviously, uh, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication to get there. But the problem is no matter how much hard work and dedication I put into it, I will never stand on that podium holding a gold medal because I just don't have the genetic makeup for it. Now, I imagine you do have the genetic makeup for it and you've put in all the hard work and you have the mental, mental strength and then somebody like Usain Bolt gets onto the scene and you realize from that point onwards it's all about the silver medal. You don't have a hope. That's not fair, but that's life. The same can be said for Michael Phelps. Um, he is truly swimming in a gene pool of his own, and I think people recognize this. And then what about Sun Ming Ming? He's the tallest basketball player in the world. So he has acromegaly, which means high levels of growth hormone, and as a result of that, he has this massive stature. Now, I think that little guy there, who's probably well over six foot himself, he, there's no way he can think that that's a level playing field. So if we think about this, in the case of Duti Chand, we're saying she has a gene abnormality, which causes high testosterone levels. She, we don't know. She has either normal, partially, or completely insensitive receptors. And therefore, as a result, we don't know what the performance advance, uh, uh, advantage is, variable effect. In the case of Sun Ming Ming, he has a gene abnormality. He has high growth hormone, normal receptors, and a clear significant height advantage. But for the T, we're saying that's not fair. But for Sun Ming Ming, that's perfectly fine. Or what about this Finnish cross-country skier, <coughs> Iro Mentaranta? I think I've completely mangled his name there. But he had seven Olympic medals, three of them gold, and five world championships in the 60s. He was exceptionally good. And he also had a condition called um, primary familial poly polycythemia, which means that he had an um, abnormality in his receptor for the EPO, or for the EPO receptor, which meant that he had sky high levels of hemoglobin. In fact, since childhood, his hemoglobin levels have been consistently above 200, and the last one was 236, keeping in mind that the upper level is 180. And in cross country skiing, that undoubtedly gives you an advantage. So, again, compare him with DT Chand. He has a gene abnormality, he has normal levels of this protein. Uh, erythropoietin, but he has hyper-responsive um, receptors, and his result is seven Olympic medals. For the teacher, and it's not fair, but for him, it is fair. Or for people competing against him, it's fair. It just doesn't make any sense. So, the only way that I can think of explaining why there's such an unfair treatment of the two different cases is if I say that this is obviously not about a level playing field. This is about protecting women's sport. So what do I mean by that? If you look at uh, sport over the, the ages, the first evidence of um, sporting activities found in cave paintings about 15,000 years ago. And then since then, between then and the ancient Olympics, uh, there's more cave paintings and pottery shards, etc. But there's not a lot of information out there. But I think it's fair to say that Probably it was dominated by men either going to war, preparing for war, or doing sport instead of war. I don't think women featured that much. And then once the ancient Olympic Games came around, there was a lot more um, document, or it was recorded a bit more, and women were excluded from sport at that stage, from the Games at least. They did have their own games, the, the Hera, the games, uh, um, the Herean Games, but they were a really poor cousin of the Olympic Games. And even in the modern Olympics, the first modern Olympics, women did not, well, they were not allowed to participate. So then it was in 1900 in the Paris Olympics for the first time that women started competing, and there was only a handful of them. So I think you could argue that women's sport, it's only in the last 100 years or so that there's been any attempt at equality. So it's still very young. And we are not there yet. <coughs> the 2012 Olympics was the first time that women competed in every summer sport at the Games, but we have to wait for Beijing 2022 before women will be competing in every winter sport event. So <coughs> it's fragile, I think. And you can ask me, what do I mean by protecting women's sport? 
Well, if you accept that sex is a spectrum, and therefore you can't push the spectrum into two boxes, you can't just draw arbitrary lines, then the natural extension of that argument is that you have to open sport to the whole spectrum. And if you keep in mind that sport as we know it today has developed really when women didn't really feature on the scene. So it's very, it's very much based in strength and power. So women are really competing in a men's environment. And as long as that's going to be the case, if you open up the sport, then it means people on the male end of the spectrum are invariably going to dominate. <coughs> and people on the female end of the spectrum might well disappear or at least be severely reduced. So unless sport itself changes to where it becomes an advantage to have a female body, um, there is a real risk if we do this that female sport will disappear. So the thing is, I don't have the answer to all these questions. Um, and I think we need to look outside the box to find these answers. I don't even know if we should be doing sex testing at all. But I do know that if we're going to consciously decide that we're going to violate people's individual human rights, we need to be 100% sure what it is we're trying to protect. And I don't personally, I don't think it's fair play. Thank you. <laughs>